flu meetings for, that for perfect. about and missed presidents all the day one. Um, and I was really comfortable kind of with everybody on so board. So somehow the assumption. Good afternoon and welcome to the Voices in Leadership, a series focusing on the nexus of science and leadership to create positive change in the world of public health. I am Betty Johnson and I have the privilege to direct this program and introduce today's guest. Kelly Ayotte served as a United States Senator from New Hampshire from 2011 to 2017 and was previously appointed as Attorney General in 2004, becoming the first woman to serve in that position in the state. During her time in the Senate, she sponsored 217 bills and earned the praise of many who tracked her career. She has appeared on the cover of Newsmax magazine, who named her number one among the 25 most influential women in the GOP and an emerging force in Congress, while NBC News described her unique identity in the Senate as a Northeastern conservative Republican woman. As a leader, Senator Ayotte has not hesitated to reach across the aisle to work on issues that are vital to the country's welfare including voting for the Comprehensive Immigration Reform Bill brought forward by the Gang of Eight, a group comprised of four Republican and four Democratic senators. Senator Ayotte remarked that the bill was a thoughtful bipartisan solution to a tough problem. Having seen the devastating effects of heroin and opiate addiction in New Hampshire and across the country, Senator Ayotte took a lead role in passing the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act, a national response to improve prevention, treatment, and recovery efforts to stem the tide of addiction. She also worked to address gaps in our nation's mental health system by passing legislation to improve mental health first aid training, suicide prevention programs, and treatment of eating disorders. She was named 2014 Legislator of the Year by the National Council of Behavioral Health. Before I turn this session over to today's interviewer, Dr. Karen Emmons, Dean for Academic Affairs, please join me as we welcome Senator Ayotte to the Voices in Leadership series at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Welcome. We're delighted to have you with us here today. And a warm welcome to all the members of our audience and the thousands of people who are um, listening and watching with us online. Senator, you have had quite a career. You have been a prosecutor, you have been legal counsel to a governor, you've been an attorney general, and you've been a United States senator. You're known for working across the aisle on some very tough issues that Betty introduced, including immigration reform and passage of the Comprehensive Addiction uh, Recovery Act. Can you tell us a little bit about how those many experiences have really shaped your leadership style and your thinking about uh, our leadership in this country? Yes, uh, first of all, thank, thank you, Dean. I'm, I'm honored to be here, and thank you, Betty. And uh, I, this is, as I think about um, leadership and issues that intersect. I mean, leadership really intersects with every single issue. And when it comes to public health, it is such an important issue to the American people, um, and it impacts every single day of our lives. And as I think about it as a mother of two children in that capacity, uh, my career, is, as you've heard already, has been diverse. And um, you learn as you go on many of these things. And I'm still learning. So I think that's the key also to also be listening and still learning. But a couple of things that I've learned about leadership, number one, um, when you're working with someone else, understand, don't, quest, don't start by questioning their motives. Um, try to understand what their pressures are and where they're coming from. Especially if you're in something like the United States Senate where people represent different states, they uh, come and represent different constituencies, and try to look for the areas of commonality that you have with that person, rather than probably many things that you disagree with, especially when it's somebody across the aisle. I think um, understanding that you need a good team, that no leader is going to be effective on their own, um, that who you surround yourself is going to definitely define on whether you can accomplish what you hope to accomplish, and putting people around you that are not only bright and capable, but who will question you when you need to be questioned. 
and not hesitate to speak up if they think that you're doing something that doesn't make sense to them and fostering a culture that will allow people to feel comfortable disagreeing with the boss uh, so that you understand and are hearing from different viewpoints. I also think that um, having you know, enough belief and courage in your convictions that you are willing to get out and make a decision because not making a decision is making a decision. <laughs> and uh, often, I think, in many contexts, you'll find that when difficult things come forward, uh, that, that people, by inaction, end up not acting on something that they need to. And so I think it's important to just know you do often have to make difficult decisions, but not making a decision can be just as consequential. It may seem more comfortable in the short term, but in the long term, you will bear the consequences for not thinking about that and making that decision for the long term. So those are some of the things that um, I've learned in my time in leadership positions. And I know that there's so much more to learn. And I think being open to seeing what other people do that are effective, that have succeeded, that will help have you learn. And I think this is a great opportunity here um, at the TH Chan, these, these lectures and leadership, the excellent people that you've had. Um, I, I'm today also at the IOP, so meeting with uh, students and meeting with other people who you learn from as well. I think it's to, be, to be open to that is important to be a good leader. One of the things that you remarked on and reminds me that leadership is really a team sport. And, it is. And how have you approached um, putting teams together? What are some of the things that you think about when you think about who to surround yourself with? I think, number one, uh, one thing I, I like to see with my team is what's their passion. Um, so do they really want to be part of this team? Uh, do they kind of have, uh, not to the, that they need to believe or think the same way I think on everything, but why do they want to be part of the team? And secondly, obviously, the basics, uh, you know, what kind of knowledge does that person bring to the team? What kind of uh, diversity of thought does that person uh, bring to the team so that you don't end up having with one monolithic group um, in your team, but you have a diversity of opinions and backgrounds? I think that's particularly helpful to have a strong, effective, uh, team. And then you also have to have members of your team, especially when you're a senator or you're holding a, a position uh, like that, um, that are the people that can pull you aside. There has to be someone on that team who can pull you aside no matter what and say, what you did there, that wasn't how you should act. Um, and if you don't have someone on your team that can tell you that, then that's not going to be a good team for you. We all need feedback, don't we? We all do, <laughs> and we have to all be willing to take it. Um, and you also have, and you have to have someone you trust enough that you can that can give you that feedback and that you're willing to receive it from. Yeah. So the um, idea of diversity of thought is really quite important. And at this moment in um, our history, I think we have really gotten to a very polarized place in our country mm -hmm. with um, congressionally seems like quite a lot of gridlock and less focus on looking for common ground. Yeah. What are some of the things that um, you've learned that could help us find a path forward towards more um, discussion across um, polarized viewpoints? I, I do think that it's our electoral process has gotten more polarized. And I think you see it reflected um, in the Congress as well, in the Senate and, and the House, in the sense that um, a lot of times when you have a, a red state or a blue state, so to speak, you the primary process is going to define um, you know, who becomes the candidate and who becomes the elected official often, not always. Um, and because that, because of that, you know, does that person who gets elected from that, are they thinking about what does an independent think about this? What does someone across the aisle think about this? And so I would say um, we see more of that, but what can we do about it? Uh, one thing I think is that we all have a part with this. In other words, you can't just look at your elected leaders and say, um, that person, uh, I'm frustrated with leadership, I'm frustrated with what happens in Washington, and say that's enough. Because if you think about going and voting for an individual, are we just voting based upon a litmus test that someone agrees with us on every single issue? Or are we going to value bipartisanship when we vote? Are we going to value people who actually are willing 
um, to reach out and put out a hand to someone who disagrees with them and take some political courage to do so. Uh, so I think we need to engage all of us in this idea of what are we rewarding and what are we, who, what type of individual and what character do they have are we trying to elect as opposed to we all have our issues that we believe in, are we just kind of going down the line in our litmus test instead of thinking of the, the types of people that we're going to put there that are willing to work together and willing to solve problems. Because I haven't seen a major problem yet um, that you haven't, had to compromise and give up something on your end um, of something, if you had to write the bill by yourself and you were one person, uh, you were in charge for a day, that's just not how our process works. And so I think understanding that all of us and trying to ask that of our leaders and expect that of our leaders as we vote for them and holding them accountable for that in office is how we can all have a piece in that. Now, as a leader, I can't just pawn it off on voters, right? Uh, as a leader, we should should expect our, our leaders to not understand and make relationships with people of different viewpoints than ourselves and find and look for ways that we can find common ground to solve our problems. So uh, I think our leaders need that as well, but it has to go both ways. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit and um, focus on the opioid epidemic. This is something that has deeply touched um, your state of New Hampshire yes, and every, every city mm -hmm. and state in the country. What are some of the things that our local and state governments can do to address this issue? I think um, one of the most important things that we have to understand um, about the opioid epidemic and is that this isn't just this, I think, people sometimes think, oh, this is just a law enforcement issue. Um, this is really a public health crisis. And one of the things that I am, am proud of in terms of the work that I did across the aisle with people like Senator Portman, Senator Klobuchar, um, you know, Senator Whitehouse, so those were the four of us who came together to put together the Comprehensive Addiction Recovery Act, is that it's really a bill that recognizes that this is a public health issue. Um, yes, there are law enforcement components, but focusing on things like prevention, treatment, recovery. Um, and so what can we do at the state and local level? It really has to happen at the state and local level. And as you think of the efforts that have happened in Washington, the CARA bill, along with the 21st Century Cures bill that had a significant opiate piece in it, it's directing the best evidence-based programs but the decisions made at the local level in those areas of how do we improve prevention and education, both within the schools, but broader, much broader than the school system. You have to get, I think, also with the public health community, with medical practitioners on things like uh, prescribing, because we know there's a huge connection between many who start with the use of prescription opiates and then, and then go to heroin and fentanyl. Um, focusing on how do we increase treatment capacity because my constituents, so many who I'm, I have met that have lost someone that they love, um, they were trying to figure out how do I get my loved one into treatment. Um, they were trying to help and they need to know that there's the capacity in the community for treatment and they also need to know how do I help? How do I, what, what are the tools that I can help someone who I love? Um, and th so there's so much work that has to be done at the state and local level with help, I think, um, from the federal level. And I think the encouraging thing that is happening is the 21st Century Cures Act um, had a billion dollars uh, allocated uh, toward this opioid issue and focused on education uh, and prevention and expanding treatment capacity. And then that complemented what's happening in CARA and you see the new administration, even in a budget that many people were critical, uh, rightly so, about many pieces of it, they also had a piece that had an increased emphasis and in funding um, on the opioid epidemic. And they've also established a task force on this issue. So I think you'll see a bipartisan continuance. But it has to happen at the state and local level. And, we, and federal officials should be relying on the best ideas from the state and local level and helping fund those. 
Your uh, points are really about the importance of what um, federal government can do wrapped around what state and local government can do and really having a two-way communication channel. I think that's really exactly right. There has to be because the federal government can't do the day-to-day -day work that needs to be done at the state and local. They can, the federal government can support those efforts, the, the federal government can help in those efforts, can partner, but it's your local community where you're going to go seek treatment. It's your local school and how they treat prevention and education. It's your local doctor who is that doctor receiving training um, on the best prescribing practices for opiates and is your local medical board or your state medical board having a discussion with their medical community about this issue and how their piece in it or with how their local prescription monitoring program operates. So I'm going to um, ask you an online a question that came from our online audience because this is really relevant. Um, so the question is that most prevention strategies advanced to date focus on interventions that occur after a person is addicted. Mm -hmm. um, and can you speak to any work that can or is being done uh, related to changing drug marketing practices and the prescribing policies that created the epidemic mm -hmm. in the first place? I think this is a, a huge issue and a really important issue. I think the national data shows that four out of five people started. Uh, with prescription opiates and then went to heroin or fentanyl. Um, and so we are a nation uh, that we are huge consumption of pain medication. And, and there's a number of factors now. So part of it is, is that really engaging the medical community. CDC came out with um, best practices guidelines, uh, prescribing guidelines for chronic pain and that address in part um, the best prescribing practices in some circumstances for opiates, but it has to be broader to that. It has to go back to the state medical boards. It has to go back to the medical schools, I think also on um, training for what are the, and, and understanding, a common understanding from the medical community of what the best practice is. What are alternative uh, pain uh, treatments for uh, people who have pain rather than just immediately going to opiate. And by the way, the other issue too is making sure that those treatments are covered. Um, when you have insurance, it has to cover not just opiates, but also alternatives uh, to opiates. And I know that that is an issue as well. Um, so there are a number of things happening. And one thing coming out of CARA that many of us, the lead sponsors, hoped would happen. and will stay tuned and I hope it does happen, but a national education campaign, one that's evidence-based, one that is really focused, coupled with local education campaigns. And I think that's something where the federal government does have an ability to do that. I think we could do that. It obviously needs to be carefully researched and evidence-based and effective, um, but coupled with the state and local efforts, and I hope we do see that happen. I think providing access to the full range of evidence-based treatments is incredibly important. Oh, uh, yes, including medical assisted treatment and, you know, the full penalty um, of treatment that, that people may need to recover. Absolutely. A second question that came from our online audience is what you see as the roles of schools in the opioid epidemic. Can you speak a bit to that? I think schools have a huge role um, and we we have to have more effective education in our schools and um, I don't pretend to be an expert on what that would be but that's where we need people like all of you who are in this room and others who are willing to come up with um, you know ev evidence-based uh, programs to really get into our schools not just in a one-off program we're going to do in high school where we bring everyone in um, in the room not that those aren't positive but it has to be continual education it has to be I think on these public health issues when it comes to issues of opiates and and it's not just opiates I think you know other there's other addictive substances as well but in terms of addiction um, and and also I would say coupled with you know mental health uh, that's why I was a big sponsor of first aid mental health first aid because you see so many co-occurring disorders right so I think we do, schools have a big part. We have to help schools have the resources to be able to do that type of training. I think in the medical schools too, there's a huge role on the medical schools to really drive this discussion among practitioners about how we should be, um, what should we be doing with pain medication? What, what, what is it that is the best um, medical 
uh, treatment and how do we treat substance use disorders is the treatment that we're using are we giving enough emphasis on the right types of treatment that are effective so that people can recover so it really is the the entire spectrum thinking about the providers and how we train future providers education is key yeah. the more yeah. we can have focus on education hopefully the more that we can reduce uh, the size of the problem because so many so many parents and not just parents but people who've been affected by this that I've met um, as a senator I mean they thought this was something that happened in somebody else's neighborhood mm -hmm. well guess what it's not this is something that happens and can happen in anyone's house and yet I don't think there was an understanding of that um, and people didn't you know haven't thought about it and it needs to be thought of that way so uh, and that's why we have to get in get in early and and make sure that we're really talk having a continual discussion on these issues not just a one-off discussion absolutely it's a very heartbreaking situation and perhaps one of the most heartbreaking is um, the impact on um, babies that are born to oh, yeah. um, uh, substance uh, addicted parents and I'm wondering if you can speak to it seems like there is some growing evidence that um, more and more babies have been yeah. exposed and I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit to that oh it's that the evidence on this is is just really devastating um, not only the national evidence but uh, state state-based evidence that more and more infants are, are being uh, born um, having uh, been exposed uh, and they you know suffer from neo neonatal natal abstinence syndrome and 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 what that does for their development obviously um, is of deep concern and so I'll give you an example in New Hampshire we now have um, by the way um, a woman who started it who I just find so inspiring started a place called Hope on Haven Hill and so she is uh, women who are pregnant who are addicted uh, has a place where they can come, they can work through um, their addiction, also have their baby, and also stay with their child and be in a position to uh, work through their own addiction to make sure that their uh, child um, gets the help uh, that, that the baby needs. And so we are needing more treatment capacity there in terms of keeping um, mothers with with their babies who are affected and knowing how we're going to uh, what how do we treat these infants and what do we do with an infant that is born uh, who's been exposed to opiates and there was national legislation actually passed about two years ago that I was a co-sponsor of that that called for Health and Human Services to establish a national strategy just focused on this issue of uh, infants that are being born that are exposed um, to, in particular, opiates. So I hope that we'll see more federal leadership on what we need to do on this based on that legislation. Mm. You've laid some very important groundwork, um, both uh, nationally at the federal level and as well as work in your own state. Can you speak a bit to how this epidemic has played out in New Hampshire and whether that's been different than in other states and, and why? It's been devastating in New Hampshire, but uh, this, New Hampshire's not alone. You know, I know that Massachusetts has had its, other states have had their challenges. That's why there was a group of us that was able to come together from, you know, Ohio, Minnesota, Rhode Island, and New Hampshire to put the CARA bill together. Uh, but New Hampshire's been hit really hard. And I was attorney general before this, so I dealt with, I was the chief law enforcement officer, so I dealt with law enforcement on many drug issues. And we've seen a dramatic spike in drug deaths in New Hampshire. And there's a couple of different factors, I would say. Uh, we were late to the prescription monitoring program. Uh, we were one of the last states in the country to put that in place. I advocated for it when, it was, attorney, when I was attorney general, but it didn't get passed till till later, so uh, we, we weren't really monitoring much on our prescription drug front. Um, and then we didn't have as much treatment capacity as we needed, we still don't, and that's a real issue in our state, and uh, our state has really come together to build on more treatment capacity. So there were a number of factors that came together, but the bottom line is New Hampshire's not unique. This is a national crisis, and this is an issue that impacts many communities, and not just urban communities, but rural communities. Uh, I know a state like West Virginia has been devastated by it as well. 
And so this is something where you've got a connection between prescription drugs and heroin. You have a lot of it coming over the southern border and the Mexican drug cartels have been quite, uh, they figured out there's a market for us here and then it's been fueled and it's very cheap on our streets, both heroin and the combination of heroin and fentanyl is a synthetic analgesic that can be as much as 50 times as powerful as heroin. So all of that came together and so it took a while for this snowball to all come together to a crisis and we, uh, it's gonna take us some time not just the state of New Hampshire, but this country, to really work through this and to address it and to help people get treatment, to work on the prevention and also the recovery. It does, you know, just because you get the drugs out of someone's system, it's not over. You have to support them in recovery after that. When we were talking before the session started today, you mentioned how this was really a bipartisan issue, that this is a place where everybody has to come together yes. because these issues affect every every community, every state, and really is something that has mm -hmm. to be addressed in partnership. It's a big partnership, and when we first came together on the bill, it took us a couple years to get it passed. Uh, part of the reason we were able to get it passed with a, such a strong vote in the end was we just, we, we got together all the stakeholders and we heard from them. We had these public forums to hear, okay, what are the best ideas of how we put this bill together? So what should be in the bill? We didn't presume that we were the experts. We really went out to the people um, in public health and in law enforcement in the states and got the best ideas, but also um, educating our colleagues, right? So saying to our colleagues in the Senate, if you haven't heard about this in your community, go talk to your emergency room physicians. Mm -hmm. Ask them what they're seeing in their emergency rooms. Uh, you know, go talk to your local law enforcement and see what they're, what they're um, impacting. Go talk to your, your, uh, your school principals and see, are they seeing this? Um, and when that started snowballing, we, people realized that this was not just something isolated to one state or one neighborhood mm -hmm. or you know, one group of people that this was something that was, had broad impact across the nation. And I think that's what allowed us to get as much support as we did in the end. Absolutely. I'm gonna um, uh, ask you one last question, um, and that is around um, the fact that your um, career has offered so many valuable insights and, and leadership uh, opportunities and examples. I wonder if you could pick one or two examples to share with our students about really key um, leadership moments or leadership strategies that you would hope as they go through their careers that they might emulate. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well, we've talked about the CARA bill, and I think the lesson there is really uh, find, find some people that you have the, the common problem with and say, let's, let's come up with the best ideas on how to solve it. And understand that you don't have those best ideas. Go to the people who are experts in public health and who are in the trenches in these to, to figure out what should we do about it, right? Not just assume that you know exactly how to solve a problem. And I think the other example is one where um, I also worked on in the public health context with Amy Klobuchar um, on the issue of eating disorders. And we passed the Anna Weston Act. And um, for a while that bill had languished without a Republican co-sponsor. And Amy came to me and, and uh, Anna's mom, who's been really passionate, um, talked to me also about uh, the story of her daughter and I started asking my own state you know how much of an issue is this and um, and also I remember frankly from my own high school experience that friends uh, that unfortunately I think were struggling with an eating disorder and I didn't know what to do about it then uh, but that's another example that got passed and so now we have really focused on eating disorders that um, more access to mental health treatment and um, understanding that there needs to also be an enforcement of the parity law when it comes to being able to get um, health coverage for uh, an eating disorder and having that mental health treatment to be able to help recover from an eating disorder. So that's another accomplishment. And I, I never could figure out why wouldn't a Republican want to get on this bill? Um, and maybe it was just understanding the issue more and being able to reach out um, on it. I think part of it is 
in terms of things that I look back on um, my time in the Senate, and sometimes it's questioning the orthodoxy of an issue, and sometimes there have been times when I've had to stand up to my own party on things that I didn't think we were headed in the right direction on, um, and that's important. I think the hardest thing to understand in politics, the hardest thing is not to disagree with someone um, from the opposite party on an issue. The hardest thing in politics is actually to stand up to your friends, so-called friends of the same party as you, and tell them that you disagree with, with them on something. That is actually much harder to do in politics than to disagree, to disagree with someone who comes from an opposing party. And we need more of that if we're going to accomplish solving some of these really tough problems that need to be solved for the nation. So the takeaways that I have from um, your um, talk today is really leadership is partnership, mm -hmm. um, diversity of thought, diversity of ideas, and really being willing to uh, explore from many perspectives a particular issue. And when you um, have evidence and you have um, knowledge that helps you pivot from perhaps where the broader opinion is, really being courageous and taking a stand yes. and, and bringing that forward to your, your colleagues and to your friends. Not so easy. No, it's uh, <laughs> elective office is not for the faint of heart, but, um, <laughs> but it is incredibly rewarding and a privilege. And uh, it's, it's obviously a great privilege to have the opportunity to solve problems and help people and to be in the arena uh, and to try to make a difference. I'm so impressed by the way in which you've brought public health into all of the work that you've done. I'm very grateful for that. We think of um, public health as really being multidisciplinary and bringing many, many different perspectives together, and you've really modeled that beautifully in the work that you've done and the examples that you shared with us today. Yeah, well, thank you. I mean, public health impacts everything we do, really, if you think about it. Um, and our quality of life and our, and our way of life. So it is a critical issue and, and really an issue where so many of challenges we face, we do need the, the expertise of people who understand what's the best way to resolve and help uh, solve a public health challenge. There are many public health challenges ahead of us. We have a few <laughs> and uh, we have a lot more work to do. How's that? We do. Yes. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks. Thank you to our audience and Thanks, to our Dean. online audience. Thank you so much for this opportunity to speak with you. I really enjoyed it. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. If you are interested in supporting this program and others like this from the Leadership Studio at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, please call 617-432-1318 for further information.